please welcome HAC Chief Policy and Political Affairs Officer, Jason Isaacson. Good afternoon. Uh, woven throughout our global forum uh, agenda this year are concerns that have assumed heightened urgency in our community and our country. The resurgence of anti-Semitism, now a murderous phenomenon in the United States as well as in Europe. The hyperpartisanship in our politics, which has made discourse venomous and defined compromise as weakness. Misrepresentations of Israel, of our people, of other minorities, of immigrants, the defense of our values, the defense of civility, the affirmation, as we declared yesterday evening, of a community of conscience. To all these, I would add one more, a question to which we've returned repeatedly over the last decade or more, and which has special resonance this week as we mark the 75th anniversary of D-Day. Is American global leadership in decline? And how could we even measure it if it were? Majority votes in the UN General Assembly? I hope not. Victory in forever wars? I don't think so. Autocracy in retreat? An American democracy rampant? Well, we'll see how that turns out. But first, we'll start with the basic question, which you see displayed above me. And to answer it in this, the AJC Global Forum Great Debate, in their own contrasting ways, are eloquent spokespersons of the American left and the American right. We're privileged to be joined in this, after, this afternoon's program by Neera Tandon, a veteran of the Clinton and Obama administrations, and for the last eight years, president and CEO of the Center for American Progress, the Washington-based progressive think tank, and Michael Anton, the conservative essayist, lecturer, and research fellow at Hillsdale College, who was a senior National Security Council official for the first 14 months of the Trump administration. Please join me in welcoming Nira and Michael to the stage. Hi. Hi. We've asked uh, Ms. Tandon and I Mr. Anton. Step. It works. <laughs> <laughs> to make opening statements of two minutes apiece, and then we'll give each an opportunity to respond. And then I'll engage both of them in several rounds of questioning, which we're expecting will generate rebuttals. And then they'll each have an opportunity to make closing statements. It's my job to keep time and to referee. Your job in the audience is to listen closely to our debaters, and however you may find yourself provoked or enraptured, <laughs> or outraged to control your emotions. <laughs> I probably don't have to say this, but I know passions tend to run high. Booing will not be tolerated. <laughs> now, let us begin the debate. Neera Tandon, you have the floor. Great, thank you so much, uh, Jason. I really appreciate uh, being able to be with you, and I'm really grateful to be here with the American Jewish Committee. Uh, for all the important work you've done over years, but particularly in this moment uh, in America and around the world, I think your leadership is more important than ever. Uh, I actually welcome a time of bipartisanship in foreign policy and in domestic policy, but we are here to argue about America's global standing, and I uh, hope that we have some areas of agreement, but I will start off by arguing that America's standing in the world has declined under Donald Trump, and in many ways has declined dramatically. I would also argue that actually the United States is not more safe over the last few years, it is less safe. Essentially, uh, the philosophy of the Trump administration is one of America leading but by itself alone and often isolated, and I would argue ineffective in the world stage. Uh, we can go around the world and argue about a variety of positions, but when you look at North Korea, for example, a North Korea unbowed today and as belligerent as ever after having secured a meeting with the President of the United States. If you look at the Middle East, it's as chaotic as ever, and even without a deal with Iran, between the United States and Iran, and the Iranian regime, 
We are in a position where we have mixed signals from the administration of whether they will argue uh, or whether they will engage Iran unilaterally without preconditions, something a few years ago was considered anathema. And if you look at the, ch at the world stage, we see a China ascendant in many ways making the case for their leadership amongst a vacuum of American leadership. And finally, I would just make a, a single point, which is leadership is about being able to lead others. And at this moment, America's allies have the most doubt they've had in decades. Thank you, Nira. Michael. Well, when I first got the, heard the topic, you know, is American leadership in decline, my response was, my gut response was, well, of course it is. I mean, how are we even going to have a debate? And then everybody in the green room said, you've got to be provocative and mix it up. So I, I had to come up with another answer. Uh, so it reminded me of a, <laughs> We could stop there. It reminded me, it reminded me of a joke from... Um, <laughs> I think the, the America's greatest living economist, Thomas Sowell, who says that economists always frame things in terms of compared to what. So two economists who haven't seen each other are walking opposite ways down the street, and they meet, and one of them says, how's your wife? And the first economist says, compared to what, right? So America's <laughs> in decline compared to what? I, uh, American leadership is less than it was in 1945, less than it was in 1989, for sure. Uh, there are countries that played almost no role in world affairs 20 years ago that are very strong now. So to some extent, relatively speaking, American leadership has declined. So I'm going to reframe the question, which is, is American leadership in decline in the age of Trump, comma, specifically because of Trump? To which I would say, no. Um, I think there's a lot of things that Donald Trump has done. First of all, let me just run through a few of these points. Are we less safe? I don't see how we're less safe. Uh, one of the main threats to U.S. interests overseas in the Middle East was ISIS. Now, ISIS isn't 100% gone, but it's been mostly defeated in its strongholds. It doesn't control the caliphate. It doesn't control oil resources and other things anymore. I mentioned the JCPOA. One of the key factors of the president's uh, wanting to exit the JCPOA is that doing business with Iran enriches Tehran, and Tehran uses those resources to threaten American interests and destabilize the Middle East. The less resources it has, the less it can do that. And in fact, we saw some... Uh, intelligence uh, that come out of the U.S. government recently saying that, showing that the Iranians talking to their proxies in the Middle East saying, hey guys, we can't pay you to the extent that we used to anymore, including Hezbollah. I think we should all think that's a good thing. I can go on about North Korea, maybe I'm almost out of time, but I think it's, it's not at all true to say North Korea is as belligerent as ever. In 2017, North Korea was firing off a missile seemingly every six weeks and conducted its first thermonuclear test. All of that, Knockwood it has ceased, let's hope it remains ceased. What we're seeing is a new process of diplomacy trying to play out after um, several decades of failed North Korea policy. And, you know, I'm going to be bipartisan about this. Bipartisan failures. These are Republican and Democratic failures, and, the, and Donald Trump is trying a new approach. So, as for the Middle East, um, I think our rebuilding our alliances with Gulf and other Arab partners has made the country more safe. But I'll stop there. We can, we can all flesh this out. Well, I want to give you a chance to read yeah. as well. First, uh, you, Nara. Sure. I'll just, I'll just walk through a few of those examples. I would argue we are less safe with North Korea because they still have, uh, as our intelligence operations say, they still have uh, lots of access. They are still on the way to developing nuclear weapons. Nothing has stopped them. And in fact, now they have had a meeting with the president in which he says he loves their leader, uh, a leader that just murdered the nuclear negotiations team on Friday. So I would argue that that probably is not a good sign for North Korea going forward. Uh, in terms of Iran, uh, a great, uh, the real issue, you mentioned Syria. Uh, we are leaving a vacuum in Syria today, and Iran's ability to maneuver in the Middle East is stronger today than it was just a few years ago. Uh, I, would, I also recognize that we have greater dissension on issues like Yemen, where Congress has uh, voted to oppose the president's policies in that he's acting unilaterally, but you see even Republican dissension on those issues. And finally, I would just like to raise the issue of tariffs. Tariffs uh, with China, tariffs now with Mexico. You see more Republican opposition because of a tariff strategy that so far has yielded no negotiating power with China. 
Uh, the argument that this president is getting tough on China, China is belied by a tariff policy that is really a tax on American workers that has yielded no result thus far. So on a whole range of issues, I think the president has raised, has had a series of foreign policies that are hurting American farmers, taxpayers, and weakening our position around the world. All right, thank you. Michael, your chance to rebut. Uh, regarding North Korea, look, the, the playbook of the North Koreans going all the way back at least to the early 90s and maybe before that is to ratchet up tension in Northeast Asia as a, as a form of blackmail in a sense, to say United States come to the table and give us something so that we stop doing this. And successive administrations of both parties have played along, they've played right into the North Koreans' hand. This is the first administration that hasn't done that. Now, this policy has yet to play out. We'll see how it goes. But so far, it has halted the testing. It's halted uh, a lot of the belligerent behavior that was going on in 2017. It's reassured South Korea and Japan, and I think we're in a stronger position there. We need to see how this plays out. Um, I actually agree with you a little on, on the Syria point. I'm a bit concerned about that, too. I don't think you need to keep a huge force in Syria, and I certainly would not support the United States intervening on either side of the Syrian civil war, but uh, I think most of the people in this room would agree with both of us that it would be horrible for U.S. interests if Syria were to become essentially a playground of the Iranians, and if that uh, ends up being a vacuum, that could well happen, and I hope that doesn't happen. Um, now, tariffs, you brought them up. I don't think they're a safety question. We certainly do disagree here. Um, the U.S. policy, specifically toward China, for 30 years has, I think, manifestly failed. That policy was that by welcoming China into the international system as a peer, it would behave uh, according to the international norms that the United States respects, that our European partners respect, that our Asian partners respect. China simply hasn't done that. And the U.S. response for decades was, we're going to complain, but we're not going to follow through on the complaints. And the Chinese government got used to hearing the United States complain and say, yeah, yeah, they always say that, but don't worry about it, they're not going to do anything. I think they're off balance and wondering what's going to happen next because they've never faced the real prospect of retaliation or a change in policy. And this is another policy that I think we're going to have to see play out. I personally am optimistic, and I certainly am convinced that we needed a change in that area. Michael, thank you. Let me, um, let me begin now the round of questionings. Um, questioning, rather. Uh, and I want to maybe turn the clock back a little bit before the Trump administration and talk about the whole topic of America possibly in decline. Um, nearer to you, President Obama yearned to advance peace between Israel and the Palestinians, but couldn't marshal the right blend of carrots and sticks or sufficient trust to keep the two sides at the bargaining table. He drew a red line against chemical weapons use in Syria and then backed away from enforcing that red line. America's friends in the Arabian Gulf told us at the time that they felt ignored by Washington. On his watch, Russia seized Crimea. China began staking territorial claims in the South China Sea. Were these signs of America's decline in global influence, America's failure to lead? Uh, were we stronger then? I think that every foreign policy of every administration should be critiqued. So I think there are aspects of the Obama administration policies that can be critiqued. But if you look at American leadership as the ability to lead global alliances to take action, it is, it is unalterably true that the President, President Obama was more able, more capable of doing that. He led the world in a uh, agreement Iran. People can disagree on the merits of it, but he was able to do that. In fact, people who we disagreed with engaged. In the Paris Accords, uh, we have a global effort to address climate change, and I would note that even conservative parties in Russia, in China, et cetera, signed on to those global compacts. Today, we have an administration that is making an argument about Iran to our European allies, and they ignore, ignore those arguments. The uh, Trump administration has been unable to garner support of allies to take action. Now, people can argue that it is the best interest to have a go-it-alone strategy. That is an argument that people can make. But when you want to marshal the world behind an action, leaders need followers. And this administration has few. And the challenge for that is when we have issues like China, and I will let me agree with Michael that 
American policy towards China has not succeeded, that the Chinese play on a completely different terrain. But one of the ways to address that is to have allies, allies in Asia, allies in Europe. One of the arguments behind the Pacific, the uh, TPP, was that you would create a global alliance to change the rules so that China would have to deal with them. You can take those arguments or ignore them. But right now, we have a series of policies in which Americans are paying higher tariffs, really essentially a tax, for a gamble a gamble with the Chinese that have yet to pay off. And we have no guarantee that this administration, which claims to be a great negotiator, will get results. Thank you, Neera. Uh, Michael, you could either rebut that or I could ask you to, I, are, are, you, are you bursting like with a rebuttal here? The JCPOA in particular. Um, because I have another question that I'd like to pose to you. Hmm? I, I, as I said, there's another question that I would like to pose to you. Go ahead. So thank you, because it will actually feed into this, I okay. believe. So uh, in a speech that, uh, I'm sorry, uh, portrayed as a master deal-maker, mm -hmm. uh, President Trump has been unsparing in his criticism, really his condemnation of a wide range of international agreements, um, treaties, multilateral understandings, structures that preceded his presidency, from the UN to NATO to pretty much every trade deal negotiated in the last century, to, as Neera said, the Paris Climate Accord, to the Iran nuclear deal. And then last fall, the president announced his intention to pull out of the Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty as well. Um, is the policy course that we're on aiming to restructure all of these arrangements to basically remake the international order, or is the objective to get out of the multilateral game, to declare ourselves the global leader, and go home? I don't think it's either. I think the objective is to address unfair or broken agreements where that can be done. For instance, the INF Treaty, you, you didn't mention the fact that the reason the United States got out of it is because the Russians had been demonstrably cheating on it since 2014 and we got fed up. Um, I don't know that that actually matters so much. It's sort of a, a Cold War relic of a treaty uh, anyway. Um, the Paris Accord. The Paris Accord was a flawed agreement. It was a, a feel-good symbolic agreement where each country could set its own targets, and the countries that are the biggest polluters set very, very low targets, while the countries that have the, the greatest uh, uh, success at curbing their emissions, green energy, and things like that, had, had set unrealistically high targets. So, I, you know, I, I don't think that the president is against agreements per se. He's against agreements that he thinks doesn't work in U.S. interests. Um, he successfully renegotiated NAFTA, for instance. They're working on, let's hope, what will turn out to be a successful renegotiation of the U.S.-Korea uh, trade agreement. So, it, it's not an either-or. It's not we're going to break it and re remake it. It's we're going to find the flaws and fix them. I think that's ultimately what motivates his can you also policy. Okay, can you also respond to Nira's question about uh, to be a leader, you have to have followers. Do we have followers? A absolutely. Look, um, Nira mentioned China. We need allies. Well, our relationship with Japan has never been stronger than it is right now. Relationship with South Korea is actually very strong, despite uh, a left of center South Korean government that usually has problems getting along with a Republican administration. Um, look what the president has done in moving the United States closer to Vietnam, uh, in strengthening relations with India. These are all the countries, and Singapore, these are all the countries that you need as allies if you're going to confront a China threat. And I think he's definitely strengthened America's hand in that, in that respect. Nira, I want to come back to the point that you were making before. Um, uh, looking at the Pew Research Center analysis of global polling data just uh, last fall, um, status or the reputation of, the, of, of America has fallen. It's mm -hmm. in many places, not all. Um, uh, there are exceptions. Israel. No, in, in Russia, it's going up. <laughs> well, okay, but also, but also Israel, also South Korea, also the Philippines, also parts of Central Europe. Mm -hmm. Does American leadership depend on American popularity? Um, can we lead if much of the world doesn't like us? Uh, you know, I think it's important that the uh, publics of the world have respect for the United States. I don't think it's the most essential ingredient. I think the most essential ingredient to American leadership is its ability to lead other countries in the direction it wants to go. And as I said, I think that is a grave challenge for us in this moment. And, and Michael mentioned NAFTA. I think this is a great example of one of the changes. Uh, the USMCA has been negotiated amongst the three countries. But, uh, Mexico just ratified. However, the fact that Donald Trump unilaterally argued, said, announced that he will have a 5% tariff on Mexico's goods to pay for a wall that he said Mexico would pay for a long time ago uh, and to address immigration is an example of how that is creating a lot of turmoil 
for USMCA's passage in Congress, not just amongst Repo Democrats, but amongst Republicans as well. So I think the chaotic leadership we often see out of this administration, an administration which the president undermines his secretaries of state, his secretary of defense, his own national security advisor just most recently on his trip to Japan that you just mentioned. Uh, I mean, I think this creates a lot of problems. And I think the world uh, sees a presidential, a leader of the United States that it cannot rely on. And I would argue that many countries in Asia and uh, around the world are looking to China, most ironically enough, for more stable leadership, which weakens our position uh, in the world. Michael? Is, well, the, is the consistent uh, mess or lack of consistency in some of the messaging uh, an issue? Um, well, uh, first of all, I hear this point made a lot, that the president is undermining these people who work for him. And I always wondered, knowing what the org chart looks like, how is that possible? He's the boss. <laughs> they can undermine him, maybe, but it's hard for me to understand how he can undermine them, since he sets policy. Um, I, I, I can tell you. <laughs> I disagree that, I, that countries are looking to China, or, or that may be very partially, narrowly true, only in the sense that countries that are near to China and afraid of China and become convinced that U.S. leadership is in permanent retreat may do so out of necessity, but nobody wants to look to China in Asia. There are, most of these countries are afraid of China and want the United States to remain involved, which is why the president's recent visit to Japan is important. His initial trip to Asia in November of 2017 was important. Um, he's, again, he's strengthening those alliances um, in a way that protects our interests and in a way that, you know, preserves a competitive edge for U.S. strategic interests and U.S. allies and partners against China. And, and in order to reassure those countries that we're not going anywhere, we're not leaving, they don't have to make a bad deal with the Chinese because they can't count on the U.S. I think we've sent the exact opposite message to what I just heard. Michael, let me stay with you. Um, in a speech that you gave at Princeton uh, yeah. and in an article in this spring's issue of Foreign Policy, you offer the historical and philosophical foundations of the Trump doctrine in foreign policy and you make a strong case for nationalism. Mm -hmm. um, liberal internationalism, you say, despite its very real achievements in the post-war era, is now well past the point of diminishing returns. Right. My question, is it in America's interest and within America's capability to forge international con consensus to confront global problems, whether it's nuclear proliferation or terrorism or mass migration or climate change, or are we better off tending to our own concerns, our own security, and expecting others to do the same. Well, I, I don't, again, I don't see that as an either or. Of course, it's always better to forge an international consensus, but it's hard, if not impossible, to forge an international consensus on an issue in which countries have fundamental disagreements and differences of interest, and they're never going to see eye to eye. And what a certain branch of liberal internationalism held was that you know, the, the agreement, the piece of paper is almost worth chasing no matter what the, uh, no matter what the outcome. And we papered over a lot of problems over the past couple of decades with agreements that really didn't have teeth or meaning. So what we need is a recognition that there, where there's possible cooperation. Countries will cooperate if they see that it's in their interest, and it'll be real cooperation. We also need to recognize that there are going to be instances where countries simply have different interests from ours and they're never going to cooperate. And anything that looks like or pretends to be cooperation will probably be, on some level, a sham at best or maybe a bad deal for us at worst. And that's what the president, I think, sees and is trying to, to work around. So we don't have to pick between cooperation and non-cooperation. We just have to be realistic about where we can find and achieve genuine cooperation and be honest about the areas where we can't. And then we do need to stand up for ourselves. Nira, does that work for you? So let me let me agree and and, and disagree. I mean, I, I I would agree actually that uh, every country has to ensure that it is focused on its security and and supporting its country. The theory of the liberal international order is that uh, American leadership can demonstrate to the world why uh, the liberal international order or democracy is in the best interest of that country. Uh, what I worry about, and I, I worry a little bit about Michael's conception, I definitely worry about a Trump administration that has uh, seemingly more fervor for dictators and more favor with our allies. And so uh, the worry I have, and I think it's central to the debate we've had as a country and may be central uh, to conversations here, which is minority groups within countries that are losing democracy are victimized 
by majorities that are out of control. And let me just give one quick example. I was recently at the Munich Security Conference. I had the great honor with sitting with uh, the leader of uh, the European Jewish Federation who happens to live in Moscow. He is deeply anxious about the Jewish community in Moscow and in Russia because the hyper, uh, you know, I think one would argue the anti-democratic, the rise of proto-fascism, the attack on minority groups is making Russian Jews feel the target of the government. My argument about a liberal democracy is not just our values, but the fact that minority rights have to be respe respected. If you want to fight anti-Semitism globally, the way to do that is through supporting democratic norms and principles, like support for minority rights. My concern is that the president's uh, favor with not just Putin, or uh, Duterte, or Erdogan, or others, or uh, the, I, the uh, or Orban in Hungary, who has clearly raised issues of anti-Semitism, is that we are turning a blind eye, not just to democracy, but the support of minority rights that are endangering groups uh, in America and around the world. Thank you, Nira. Um, <laughs> let me stay with you. Um, Nira, in a report that your center issued uh, last month called America Adrift, mm -hmm. Your colleagues conducted focus groups and national polling to paint a picture of American attitudes on foreign policy and on the importance of global leadership. What you found was a pretty even split, 51 to 44 percent, between those who agreed that America is stronger, quote, when we take a leading role in the world and advance common goals with allies, and those who believe the opposite, that, quote, America is strong when we focus on our own problems. My question, how do you make a case for global leadership when maybe just half the public truly supports the concept? And how close is this sentiment to support for America first? So I think that this is very explicable, which is I don't think any American leader should argue that we should, uh, we should put American investment or American support second. In fact, that is the great irony of the current administration. The current administration, the Trump administration, is cutting investments, cutting investments in healthcare, cutting investments in education. The Chinese are rapidly investing in zero to 22. Uh, age, people age zero to 22 because they see that as competition for us. They're investing in research. The Trump administration is cutting investments at home and uh, ignoring allies abroad, I think that is the big challenge. How you square that circle, is, and I hope leaders, progressive leaders, center-left leaders in the United States can recognize, is to have a strong agenda of making America stronger by investing in ourselves, and investing in our education system, investing in innovation, and ensuring that we are global leaders that work through allies to ensure America's interests and global interests align. Nira, thank you. Michael, your chance to rebut? Well, look, to, to your question, in a way, liberal internationalism is or was America first. And that sounds like a paradoxical statement. But you go back and read the founding documents of the post-Cold War era, or sorry, the, the post-World War II era and the pre-Cold War era, uh, all the people, the, the so-called wise men who set up that system, were saying, we have to do this in our, because it's in our interests. We have to have NATO because it's in our interests. We have to stay involved in the world because it's in our interests. There was not a dichotomy between what is in our interests and staying involved. Too much of the foreign policy debate uh, presumes that you have to pick, and they're in inevitable tension. And I think that's false. What happened, though, in my view, is that we became the liberal international order uh, was so successful at doing what it was designed to do that it came to be seen by the foreign policy establishment and elite as a kind of toolkit that would work on any problem in any circumstance and would have to go on for all time. And we never, to this day, made the corrective to that. And I think, you know, uh, America still doesn't have a coherent, it's still groping for, in a certain sense, a coherent sense of what its role in the world should be post-Cold War, post-9-11. Uh, um, the immediate post-9-11 aftermath, I think we lost our way, and the Trump administration is, again, an attempt at a corrective to get back toward a more moderate, sensible path. Uh, it's still early in this administration. Uh, it could be even earlier than we think, assuming he's reelected. But I think what, whether or not uh, 
President Trump gets eight years or only four years, American foreign policy has changed forever because of his election and what he's done. And I think it's changed for the better. And I think his successors are going to um, accept the basis of what he's done and continue the corrective. What a great lead into our final statements. Uh, I think you've just pitched it right to Nira. Uh, Nira, you get the first uh, word on uh, closing uh, arguments. Uh, so I want to. Uh, this has been a lively debate. Uh, we could have covered many other topics. I think one. Uh, I think I'd like to try and agree with Michael on on some issues, which is that we should not uh, we should not adhere to a liberal international order of the 1950s or 1960s uh, for the sake of making foreign policy people who studied it feel good. Uh, it has to be, uh, our foreign policy should first and foremost be focused on ensuring that America is strong and secure. And my criticism of the Trump administration is that it has policies that seem to weaken us uh, and weaken our ability to lead. And uh, I've walked through some of those examples, but let me just finish with where I, I just was ending. My deepest concern is that the, uh, the administration's um, support and, uh, and basically engagement with the world's uh, dictators is sending an, an increasing argument to the world that democracy has its limits. My view is that we are essentially making the Chinese argument on this global stage for it, which is that democracy is dying and autocracy is the way of, wave of the future. And uh, the uh, inability of, a, of our country to champion our allies in Europe or other countries that are democracies and instead support those countries which have fa really proto-fascist uh, impulses is deeply concerning and I think should be concerning for all Americans. Nira, thank you. <laughs> Michael, I think you have the last word. Um, well, rebut a couple of those things. Uh, first of all, you've got to talk to bad guys and every president does it. Uh, I think it's vastly <laughs> overstated the extent to which President Trump is supposedly in love with these uh, uh, authoritarian uh, types. I mean, he, he literally uh, says of he all loves the, them. Of all of the, <laughs> uh, it's, 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 Im, it's impossible to say, to point to anything like, for instance, the Trump administration has actually given to Vladimir Putin that he really wants. Um, we, we've, if, uh, in so many ways, the administration has gotten tougher. Um, I, I certainly dispute the notion that democracy is dying, but I would point out, if democracy is dying, one of the things that I rarely hear brought up, but I'll bring it up, is uh, what, what do things like the EU or uh, these supranational bureaucracies that can override or ignore popular votes have to do with democracy? It seems to me that they, not much. Um, it was three years ago that the British voted to get out of the European Union this month, and they're still in, and they don't seem to have any prospect of getting out. I, I, it doesn't seem particularly democratic to me, so I'm not nearly worried, uh, as worried about these trends as Nira is and as a lot of people to my left are. I'm more worried about finding the right balance, and I would hope in a bipartisan way, because American foreign policy is always at its most successful when it's bipartisan, uh, finding the right balance between the, all of the issues that we talked about. That's what we're looking at here, not an either or, not a hard turn to the left or to the right, but finding the right balance. So just to do a very quick rebuttal, uh, the administration rolled out the red, corpa, cor <laughs> red carpet for Orban. The president had a Helsinki summit in which he said he, uh, he believed Vladimir Putin over our own intelligence uh, forces about Russian interference in our elections, which the Mueller report just detailed uh, for, again. Uh, in terms of policies, uh, in terms of his policies, let me just provide a few areas of policy in which the Trump administration has actually uh, aligned itself with the interests of Russia, attacks on NATO, arguments against countries entering in NATO. In fact, our policies exiting Syria are in line with what Russia wants. Uh, the, every effort to undermine the European Union and the, Euro and the US European alliance uh, helps Russia. And let me just say, I find it particularly odd that this administration has harsher words for Angela Merkel than Vladimir Putin. One of those <laughs> countries is a historic Thank ally. The other country tried to interfere with our elections. It seems to me it's a no-brainer for a president of the United States. 
Okay. Nira, thank well, you. Uh, that was a rebuttal to a rebuttal, and now, Michael, you get so the final rebuttal. I don't know. I, I find something inconsistent in saying the United States is, um, under the Trump administration, is not being good to allies, and then saying, when we have an ally come to visit, uh, the president of Hungary, uh, roll out the red carpet. Well, what else are you supposed to do for your allies? Um, uh, as to NATO, look, the president has been has been hard on NATO, but constructively hard. And in the, there's only one difference between what he said about NATO and what past presidents have said. All past presidents have said, NATO, you have to step up, meet your commitments, spend more, contribute more to the alliance. The difference is, it's like what I was saying about when the US lectures China, uh, NATO came to believe there's no follow-up to this. It's all bark and no bite, so we don't have to do anything. Under President Trump, they now realize, oh no, he may follow through in some way, we have to step it up. So you've seen a lot of these countries actually start to increase their budgets and make a bigger contribution, which over the long term will make the alliance stronger. What I'm hearing, and I've heard it before, is a sort of, we have to just keep doing what we were doing, and if we, any kind of deviation amounts to a wrecking ball to the international order, when it's certainly certain people's feelings are gonna get hurt, Our allies don't like to be lectured, they don't like to hear that they're not meeting their commitments, even when they're not, but if you're going to get them to meet their commitments, you've gotta be honest. Okay, we could do this for another two or three hours, but we do not, unfortunately, have the time. I wanna thank Michael Anton and Nira Tandon. I wanna thank you all Bye. for your attention. We look forward to the next great debate in Berlin. Thank you.